Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar series. And I'm very happy to have Professor Pathanal Roy from ISI Bangalore with us. And uh, so before starting the talk, let me just remind you of the uh, some of the instructions uh, uh, we should follow for the smooth running. Uh, so uh, I request you all to keep your audio on mute. And if the question answer session will be at the end of the talk. If you want to ask any questions in between the talk also, you can use a raise hand feature and uh, or also post your uh, question on chat. So in that case, so if you're using raise hand feature or posting the question, you should wait for the signal for, uh, from the signal from the coordinator. Professor Arupal is the coordinator. And uh, so when he gives the signal, then uh, one should answer the question by using the audio. So let's start with the talk. So welcome, Professor Roy. OK. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, it's uh, a pleasure to give a talk in ISI Delhi seminar, except that I'm not in Delhi. That's the only uh, not so pleasurable part, but that's OK. We have to deal with it. So uh, I'm not very experienced in this uh, mode of uh, giving talks, just like more, more many of us, I guess. So uh, please feel free to stop me. So you cannot really stop me directly, but you have to just say something in the chat. And then I think Aurudha will uh, definitely uh, going to stop you. And if you have any questions also. So, uh, so it's, uh, thank you again for the invitation. So this is a, a paper that uh, most of the work was done uh, like maybe a few years back, but then since I am the only author, I was getting very lazy. And then in the end, the lockdown actually helped because there was a lot of technicalities that needed to be checked, which I could check uh, during the lockdown. So, so this is about, uh, what is this talk about? This has a lot of uh, phrases in there and I'm going to explain all the phrases. And I would like to mention that um, this paper is dedicated to the memory of uh, Professor J.K. Ghosh, who was a um, professor in two half courses in ISI. So, uh, yeah. so this talk is about connection between three areas. So probability theory is what is called stable random fields. I'll explain that. And then algorithmic theory of uh, non-singular actions. These two subjects are already connected to what is called Rosinski representations. Again, I'm, I'm going to tell you what it means. On the other hand, through the work of Murray and von Neumann, the ergodic theory of non-singular actions was connected to the operator algebra, mainly the von Neumann algebra, <clears throat> through this group measure space construction. So obviously, if you have two things which are already connected, so let's can we connect these two? And then therefore, the next thing is to connect this. And then the question is, how good is this connection? Okay. And of course, that's a big question. We have to understand what it means. And secondly, how useful is it? So these are the two questions that we are going to address in this talk. So obviously, there are many terminologies. And I'll go uh, slowly, one after the other. And there will be parts where I think the operator algebra is will be completely bored. There will be parts where the travelist will be completely bored, and so on. So, OK, so the first, I'll start with what is called the stable random field. This is the probabilistic aspect of, the, of this work. So I'll start with what is called a symmetric alpha stable distribution. So let me just make the notations clear. All the random variables, random processes, whatever random is there, unless mentioned otherwise, will be defined on a common probability space, omega AP. That's kind of the standard notation used in any probability paper or any probability work. And the, since the P would be this math BBP, the corresponding expectation operator would be written by math BBE. This, this operator. So a random variable X, which is essentially a measurable map from omega to R, is said to follow symmetric alpha stable distribution, which I'll always going to abbreviate as S alpha S. Sometimes I'll just say stable to mean symmetric alpha stable. Where alpha is a parameter, which is between zero and two, two is inclusive, zero is not. And there is another parameter called scale parameter, sigma, which is positive, And we will denote it like this. If the Fourier transform of this random variable or the characteristic function of this random variable looks this like this. 
Now, it's not at all obvious that this is a valid characteristic function. In other words, it's not at all obvious that there is there actually exists a random variable for which this is the Fourier transform, but it can be shown that it exists. Now, to know more about it, I referred to this monograph of my advisor, Samornitsky and Taku. There are two special cases which are well known. One is alpha equal to two, then X follows the Gaussian distribution or the normal distribution. And alpha equal to one, is a Cauchy distribution, if you know what it is. In this talk, however, I'm going to assume that the random variable is non-Gaussian. So alpha is going to be strictly between zero and two. So alpha equal to two is disallowed throughout the talk. This will immediately imply that the tail, by the way, I should have mentioned this before this, is that the fact that we are taking expectation of a complex value random variable, but in the end, we are getting a real value number for every theta. This will imply immediately that x has a symmetric distribution. So in other words, x and minus x has the same law under this measure p. E. So therefore, x is a symmetric random variable, and that's why it's called symmetric alpha stable. So therefore, it's if you want to look at the tail of the random variable, it doesn't matter. You can either take the absolute value tail of that, or you can take the right tail or the left tail, they're going to be equal. In any case, the tail behaves like a constant times x power minus alpha at x goes to infinity. So the tail is a power law tail. Just contrast this with the Gaussian case. If alpha equal to two, alpha was equal to two, then this would be actually exponential. Okay? And in particular, the moments will be finite if and only if, the pth moment will be finite if and only if p is less than alpha. For example, when alpha is one, we have Cauchy distribution. We know that Cauchy distribution doesn't define a mean because P one, P is equal to one in that case and alpha is also one. Okay, so this is just a basic random variable that I'll be dealing with, but I won't be actually dealing with the random variable. I'll be dealing with the random process involving this random variable. So what is that? So that is called stationary S alpha is random fields. So what is that? So this will be always indexed by a group. So let G be a group. So in the entire work, the group is always countable, but it's possibly non-commutative. And the identity element will be denoted by E. So a collection of random variables indexed by this group G, defined on this common probability space, is called a symmetric alpha stable random field if Take any linear combination of these XTIs, okay, that's going to follow some symmetric alpha stable distribution. So if that happens, then we'll say that this is a symmetric alpha stable random field. So all I'm saying is all possible linear combination should follow symmetric alpha stable with a suitable, suitable scale parameter. Remember there was a sig sigma also, but alpha should be the same for all linear combination. Sigma will keep on varying, but it will be ordered once they are symmetric alpha stable, if such a random, if such a process exists, then they will all match in certain way. Okay. So we say that such a random field, so this other word, this is essentially a collection of random variables indexed by a group such that all possible finite dimensional distributions are specified through this linear combinations. And the, all the linear combination are actually symmetric alpha stable random variable. Now we say that this random field is left stationary if if you take any s in G, you multiply this indexing parameter by left multiply this by s. This new random field has the same law as the old random field. So in other words, in the indexing parameter, left multiplication is measure preserving. So it's, that's why it's called stationary. Now, we won't use the word left over and over again. We'll just say stationary to mean left stationary. And of course, there is a parallel theory of right stationarity also, but it's, it's analogous. So we are not going to bother about it. And of course, if the group is abelian, there is no difference anyway. So what are the important special cases for the group? So the most important special case perhaps is when G equals Z. So this gives you a process a symmetric alpha stable, stationary symmetric alpha stable process. ZD is another one, and also free groups, for example. You can just uh, have other groups like discrete Heisenberg groups, hyperbolic groups, lamplighter groups, various cases. So this talk in, 
initial part would be for general countable groups and then we'll specialize to zp and in the end we'll have some discussions about other groups okay now one of the ingredients that is going to be very important for me is what is called a non singular group action now what is that so you have a group and then you have a collection of maps indexed by this group it's called a non singular it's also called a quasi invariant group action on a sigma finite standard measure space so it's a standard borel space with a sigma finite measured on that if this is just a group action and it's a measurable group action so each phi t phi t is indexed by this g right each phi t is a measurable map and of course e corresponds to phi e is its identity map and you have the group action property phi of t1 dot t2 is phi t2 composed of phi t1 now one thing that i want to warn if this here t1 dot t2 is there and then i am composing phi t2 with phi t1 phi t2 this ordering is important if the group is non commutative and if you are more used to the group action notation used in algebra then essentially we are looking at phi t is the map s going to t inverse dot s and why we have this ordering we will we'll see that it's because of the left stationarity comes from that if you consider right stationarity we have to reverse this thing okay now this is the non singularity of the quasi invariance which says by the by the way these properties will ensure that all the phi t's are one to one and on to map from s to s so therefore mu compose phi t is again a measure for all t quasi invariance or non singularity says that mu compose phi t should be all the mu compose phi t should be equivalent to each other in the sense that they should be this uh, these two measures should be absolutely continuous with respect to each other in other words if, in, in another words the radon nicotine derivatives will exist and they will be fine they will be positive almost okay and no one important special case is when this this two are not just equivalent they are actually equal if that happens then we say this this action is measure preserving and measure preserving is of course a special case of non singular but not the con the converse is not true non singular is not always measure preserving now there are these references uh, that you can read about these actions and bradarajan always used to call it quasi invariant in his book by the way all the references i have compiled them in uh, in the last few pages there will be some more references than what i use but i have put them anyway and i am anyway going to share the slides with uh, with the uh, organizers so uh, feel free to uh, have a look at that okay now this is the most important slide in the part and this is sort of the most technical also so i'll go slightly slowly if possible suppose you have a stationary s alpha s bit indexed by a group then there exists a sigma finite standard measure space s a function f which is in l alpha in the sense that this particular this particular integral is finite I'll make a comment on this later, but uh, one more thing. Another component that will exist here is a non-singular G action on this standard measure space. Okay, I just define what that means. Such that, okay, so what, what are they going to do? Such that we know that if it's a symmetric alpha stable random field, then all the linear finite linear combinations, finite real linear combinations of the random variables should follow an S alpha distribution. and this function f and the group action phi t and the measure mu will give us the parameter for every linear combination so in other words if you look at the finite linear combination of these random variables this is going to be a symmetric alpha stable with the, with this okay i'll call this l alpha norm with the abuse of notation l alpha norm of this linear combination of fti so what are the fti i am going to give tell you soon but before that one comment i'm just calling it l alpha norm but this is actually not a norm if alpha is between 1 and 2 remember alpha is between so if alpha is between 0 and 1 alpha is always between 0 and 2 if alpha is between 1 and 2 obviously then this is a norm but if alpha is strictly between 0 and 1 then this is not a norm but i'll still call it a norm just for uh, abuse that i feel the terminology and for easy presentation now what is ft if t is something that can be completely written in terms of this f this function f this measure mu and this this action phi t 
So how does it look? Let's first forget about this part. It's basically phi t is a map from S to S. You just compose F with phi t. That's your FP. Except that if you compose F with phi t, even if F is in L alpha, this may not remain in L alpha because our action is not measure preserving. If our action was measure preserving, this would have been in L alpha. So therefore, we have to cap this correction factor, which is the radon nicotine derivative power one over alpha. If you do that, this will be in L alpha. What I'm saying is I'm cheating you a bit. There's a plus minus one, which is a plus minus one value for cycle. I'm not going to talk about it. Don't worry about that part now. Okay, there's, this is true except for a sign, change of sign, which I'm not going to tell you how exactly it's changing and so on. So in other words, if you, if you forget everything, if you want to remember anything uh, from this, remember that a symmetrical festival random field induces, among other things, a non-singular G action on some standard measure space, such that the, the random variable, the, the, all the linear combinations, their distributions are completely specified using this function F, this, this non-singular action by T and the measure mu. Okay, conversely, if you start with these three ingredients, you can always find the stationary sulfur as random field satisfying this condition. Okay. See, everything is purely existential result, by the way. This FT, this collection of maps FT, which completely determines the finite dimensional distributions of the XTs, because it determines the linear combination, distribution of the linear combination, therefore the finite dimensional distributions as well. This is called a Rossinsky representation because this was found by Jan Rossinsky in 1995. He found it for the group uh, Z, but the same proof goes through for any group. You have to be a little bit careful about non commutativity in general. But yeah. Now, more I've used the word yeah, ah, here, not the. That's because this is not unique. The natural question is is it unique? No, this is not unique. So, given a random field, this action is not unique. This function is also not unique. Okay? This triplet is not unique. So, the, that's where a problem will occur. So, we'll see what. How, how that affects us. Okay. Now this, interestingly, why I, I have used red on the, this action and forgotten everything else in some sense, is that it so happens that most of the probabilistic properties of XT is somehow hidden in this action phi t. Okay. So various probabilistic properties are sort of connected to the ergodic theoretic properties of under a non singular action. I'll go a little bit quickly here. There's a body of work done by various people, including myself, but which connects these uh, ergodic theory properties with the probabilistic properties of non singular actions and stable random fields. Now, only thing I would like to mention is that most of this work, in the most of this work, G is either Z or ZP, except two of them. In this work, G can be the free group, and in this work, G can be a sort of high hyperbolic group or more generally any group that is acting on a negative Descartes space. The actions could be all, all geometric actions. Okay, so uh, the present work actually carries this link between ergodic theory and probability forward to, to von Neumann algebras. Okay. Using what is called the group measure space construction, cross measure construction of Maria and von Neumann. So let's now take a short tour on von Neumann algebras. So, uh, what I'm going to assume for simplicity and ease of application also is that suppose we have a hill space over and I look at BH, which is all bounded linear operators on that. Now, of course, on that you can talk about the norm topology, which is the standard norm that we use. On, on any Hilbert space, or in fact, any Banach space also can be this now. But anyway, uh, now it's uh, this is the this is a different way of writing the same topology. Nobody does it, but this is a topology of uniform convergence on bounded subsets of H when H has the inner product topology. And why do I write it in this uh, rather uh, unnecessary way? We'll see that soon. One of this topology has some problems, and so this is very strong and hence restrictive. So therefore, even if H is uh, separable to start with, BH may not be separable. Separable in most cases, it won't be. It's special cases, and also therefore it becomes difficult to carry out sophisticated analysis. So therefore, we need some weaker topologies, and that's what is done in the next topology. This is a strong operator topology. By the way, I'm cheating you in the sense that I'm going to not give you the basic 
uh, the uh, topology using uh, basic open sets, I'm going to give you other the convergence criteria for the topology. So using nets. By the way, this topology is metrizable, so I should I could also use a sequence, but the next ones are not going to be metrizable, so I actually need a net. So the next topology is basically the pointwise convergence topology on H with the same on H. If you take the usual inner product topology, and then you look at the pointwise convergence of the operators, then that induces a topology, and that is precisely strong. So this is the this this is the convergence criterion. Now we have we have weakened the convergence from uniform to uniform unbounded to pointwise. Now we'll weaken again now the topology on H. Namely, instead of the inner product topology, which is a strong topology on H, we'll use the weaker topology, the weak topology. If you do that, if you use the weak topology on H and then look at the point by convergence of operators, of nets, of course, the nets of operators, then that gives rise to the weak operator topology. So these are the three topologies that are going to be useful for us. Now, what is the relation? It's very easy to check that non-topology convergence implies strong operator topology convergence, very easy. And then cauchy schwartz will immediately tell you that strong operator topology convergence implies WOT convergence. Converses are not true. There can be examples, very easy examples that can be given on L, small L2 of uh, uh, any space. Uh, so uh, I, I'm not going to, time on that it was not going to be important for us and what is important is that therefore this is the weakest of all the weak operator topology strong operator topology is somewhere in between and norm topology is the in the strongest one and uh, of course norm topology had some problems and those problems are sort of resolved partially at least in these topologies in particular what makes the thing going is this result of von neumann it says that suppose you start with an M, which is a subalgebra of BH. Subalgebra means it's one, it's a linear subspace of BH, and also it's a closed under multiplication of uh, operators. Uh, so if you do that, then, and also it's a star subalgebra. So that means if T is there, T star has to be there also in M. And suppose it contains the identity operator. So it's a unit of star subalgebra. Then the following statements are equivalent. So even though I said weak and strong topology, there is an ordering, weak is, is weaker than strong, but for this kind of a subset, subalgebra of pH, the closeness is same for both of these topologies. And the third property is even more weird in some sense. The double commutant or the bicommutant of M is equal to M. Now what is a bicommutant? For, for M, any, any, sub, any M subset of pH, not necessarily a start subalgebra or anything, M dash is a commutant, which basically is, if you look at all, all operators in the, in the bigger space, BH, which commutes with everything in N. Okay? So that's your commutant. And then you take one more commutant. So you take commutant of this commutant, that is equal to M. Now, one of the things that you can trivially check, you take double commutant and M is definitely contained by definition inside M double dash. The converse is not necessarily true, which is true in these conditions. So this is called von Neumann's bicommutant theorem, and this is very useful because the first two are completely analytic properties, but the second one is an algebraic property. And then therefore this result very nicely binds these two, uh, these two areas, algebraic, algebra and analysis, very nice. Of course, uh, the caveat is that the algebra and analysis are not completely independent here. They are they're dependent, that's why this result can be proved. And one of the things that makes them dependent is the projections. The projections are on one hand algebraic, and also you can describe them algebraically, they're also analytic, they come up analytically naturally. So projections help uh, this object to, this proof, uh, this proof to go through. Now, uh, any uh, unital star subalgebra, unital meaning one is there, the identity operator is there. In, unital subalgebra of BH, satisfying one and hence all of, all of the conditions above is called a von Neumann algebra. By the way, von Neumann, when he started this uh, uh, subject, most probably he or someone else, his co-authors later on, Called, used to call it a W star algebra. So, but these days I, I, I always see people who write von Neumann algebra. Standard references for von Neumann algebra is the book of Sundar, of course. It's uh, very classical, very nice. And then these are these two are actually lecture notes, and I have given links to that uh, in the in ending slides. 
So I'll, I'll share the slides with the, the organizers and they can share it. Okay, so uh, one important type of uh, monomial algebra plays a very important role and that's, those are called factors. These are the building blocks in some sense. So what is a factor? So a fundamental algebra M is called a factor if it's centered is trivial. Now what is a center? So remember M dash, in the definition of M dash, I'll quickly go back. I took all T's in BH that commute with, all T's in BH that commute with all, all elements in M. That was the M dash. Here, I'm going to allow only T's from the ambient Bonnerman algebra. And then I want it to commute with everything else. So all the things inside M that commutes with everything in M, that's the center of, of the Bonnerman algebra. Trivially, if you take identity operator that commutes with everything, as any scalar operator, scalar times identity operator also will commute with everything. So C times one, the set of all scalar operators is trivially inside the center. When actually it's equal to the center, center then it's called a factor. Now, why is it a building block? This result of von Neumann will tell you. Any von Neumann algebra can be decomposed as a direct sum or more generally direct integral of factors. So in other words, there exists a standard measure space. I should have written that anyway, such that this integral makes sense. There is, there is a notion of direct integral. And if you want to see this, this, this uh, master thesis of uh, Soren Knudby is uh, has a very nice description of uh, direct integral and such that what happens is each MY becomes a factor. Okay. In general, not each MY, almost all. Okay. Almost all MY under this measure row becomes a factor. By the way, this has to be a sigma finite standard measure space. I forgot to write that. Okay. Now, therefore, we see that M can be written as direct sum or direct integral of the factor. So therefore, for an ornamental algebraic point of view, it's enough to study and classify factors. And that leads to the subject of classification of factors, which I'm completely going to hide under the carpet with apologies to all, all the fundamental algebra colleagues or operator algebra colleagues, because I don't have that much time. The only thing I would need is what is called the type two one factor. So factor M is called type two one. If it's infinite dimensional, infinite dimensional means infinite dimensional as a vector space. It's a subalgebra, so a vector space also. And it admits a normalized stress. So this is a rigorous definition. The moment I explain what is stress, this will become quote unquote, because I would say there exists a continuous linear functional called trace from M to C, such that trace of identity operator is one that's normalized. And then it's uh, symmetric, AB equals VA, and it's not negative. In the sense, trace of S star A is bigger than equal to zero. But the point is what, what topology am I taking for continuity? If I want to exactly explicitly tell you that, then I have to introduce one more topology and then that would be too much. So I'll just keep it vague. It's a slightly stronger topology than the weak, weak operator topology. It's called ultra weak topology, but anyway, it doesn't matter. But this is a definition that we coin, I coined in this paper. It's called a von Neumann algebra M is said to admit no to one factor in its central decomposition. If M has a central decomposition, of course, such that almost for almost all Y, under this measure row, okay, MY is not a factor of type two one. So that's why it doesn't admit any two one factor. So why is countable? I should have told you in the previous slide. But anyway, go count measure on Y, then the direct integral would become a direct sum. And in this case, what I'm saying in this definition is that all the MYs should be a factor, but not of type two one. Now, of course, I'm hiding a lot of other types of factors, but I don't need them in this uh, story. So therefore, I'm skipping. Okay, so let's quickly recall there was this definition of non-singular action, which basically is a generalization of measure, measure preserving action, which is basically you're acting on a space in a measurable way such that the null sets are preserved under the shift. Okay. So suppose you have a group which is countable. And then you have a standard measure space on which you have a non-singular action. Now, this is again a fake. I won't, I won't give you full details for this uh, definition at all. It's possible following the work of Maria and von Neumann, who did it in the measure preserving action case, but it's possible to just directly extend it. One can construct a suitable von Neumann algebra as a subalgebra or a suitable space such that 
it encodes the ergodic theoretic properties of this action. Now, of course, you have to tell, you will ask me, what do I mean by that? And I'm not going to tell what exactly it means, but sort of various ergodic theoretic properties of the action has counter von Neumann algebraic counterparts for this von Neumann algebra, whatever that is. This one is called the group measure space construction. Now, the notation is either this or that. This is much simpler. When you know the action, obviously, then you write like this. Now, this is a very, uh, this is an analogy with, with a semi direct product. If you know what is a semi direct product of groups, remember that this is a, this is, if you forget about this G, this is a von Neumann algebra, but this is a commutative von Neumann algebra. And if you, if you look at this group measure space construction, whatever that is, you, you actually apply a twist using this action. And then, therefore, this becomes highly non commutative That happens ex also for semi-direct product of groups also. If you take two, two commutative groups, you take the semi-direct product, that, be that becomes highly non commutative also. Anyway, if you forget everything, just remember that, that uh, you know, this, is a, this is an abstract object. It's a von Neumann algebra that somehow has a lot of information about the ergodic theory properties of the action. OK, so is there any question in the chat? I think this is a good time to take questions, if, I, if any, because now I'll start sort of a statement of the theorems and so on. Let me summarize what I have so far. If, if there is no question, then I'll just go on. If there is any question, one of you have to ask me because I'm not following the chat at all. Okay, so I think you can continue. Okay, so I started with this object for stable random field, which is a probabilistic object. And then using Rosinski representation, even though that is not unique, I got a non-singular group action. It may not be unique. It may be, there may be other group actions also. In fact, there will be other group actions also. Then using the construction of Murray and von Neumann, we can go to the group measure space construction. This construction is unique. Once you know that group action, this is a unique thing. Unique meaning, of course, up to a von Neumann algebra isomorphism, but it's unique. Then of course, the question is, is this unique? Is this connection unique? Once you take this and that together, is this unique? Of course, you cannot expect that to be unique all the time. You need some conditions. Then only this will be unique because this is not unique. So the condition is yes, provided the Rosinski representation is minimal. Now I told you what is a Rosinski representation. It's some bunch of functions which gives the joint distribution of all possible XTs, which has some group action in it. A minimal means, in some sense, it is minimal. Minimal in the sense, a Rosinski representation will be called minimal if any Rosinski representation can be written in terms of that. That's a, that's a rough description. I'm going, not going to make it more precise than that. Answer would be yes, provided it's minimal. And of course, the next question is, it is useful. That's a, that's a more relative question, but still, it's an important question. We'll see. We'll see how useful it is. Okay, so let's, let's uh, look at our first result. Suppose xt is a left stationary s alpha s random field indexed by a countable group g. Suppose you have two different non-singular actions obtained from two minimal representations. By the way, Jan Rosinski in his work actually proved that if a representation is minimal, it has to be of his form, Rosinski form. But converse is not true. Any Rosinski representation may not be all, always minimal, whatever that minimal means. Okay? If you have two actions coming from two different minimal representations, then the corresponding group measure space constructions are going to be isomorphic. So in other words, sorry. So note that what is fixed is the stationary s alpha is random field is fixed. I'm just taking two different minimal representations, two minimal, two, two different actions coming from two different minimal representations and corresponding group measure space constructions are going to be isomorphic. In particular, the group measure space construction becomes an invariant for any minimal representation of a fixed stationary s alpha is random. And this is true for any countable group. I can go through the proof, it's actually, not difficult at all. So the idea is, once you have two minimal representations and you have two actions, you can show that the two actions are actually isomorphic as group actions. Okay? It just means that you have a map that goes from this set S1 to S2, such that action in one space is just taken by this map to the action on the other space, that's all. So this is isomorphic, this is a one one onto map. So this was proved by Jan Rosinski for the group Z. 
if you just be careful about commutativity, non-commutative, the potential non-commutativity of the group, and you know, just uh, you have enough coffee and start uh, extending it, you will be able to extend that. It's not hard. Once you have that, this will imply immediately that the actions are orbitally valid. Now I'm going to tell you what that means. That means you have a map from S1 to S2, one, 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 two maps, such that orbits are mapped to the orbits. Okay. So if two actions are isomorphic, then orbits are always going to the orbits. That's obvious. But the converse is not true. Just because orbits are going to orbit doesn't mean they're isomorphic. So, so this is a weaker equivalence between group actions. So they, that will be orbit equivalent. And then we'll invoke a result of Singer from 1955, which will say that once two actions are orbit equivalent, it's a similar result actually, then the corresponding group measure space constructions are actually isomorphic as one number algebras. So this is the proof. This is, uh, you know, uh, I'm saying sketch because this extension needs to be done with uh, care, that's all. Other than that, this is just the proof. Now, um, I just would like to make one comment. This work of Singer, which said that if two actions are orbit equivalent, then uh, the corresponding group measure space constructions are isomorphic, gives rise to a huge connection between a Gordic theory and, and uh, von Neumann algebras. In particular, these types that I was talking about, a type two one I told you, right? They can now be defined for, uh, for uh, group actions also. A type for group action also defined just using, it's called Krieger type, but Krieger actually borrowed it for von Neumann algebras, that's all. It's just using the von Neumann algebra language. Okay, so uh, then uh, so far what we have understood is that the minimal group mesh space construction is an invariant for any stationary self random field. And what is that minimal group mesh space construction? It's just this one. You, we know that whenever you take a minimal representation, you get a unique, uh, this, this becomes an invariant, all of them are isomorphic. So uh, uh, it's unique up to isomorphism. So this guy is what we are going to call the minimal group mesh space construction of a symmetric alpha stable, stationary symmetric alpha stable random field. So this is an invariant. Same holds if you know what it is for stationary mass stable fields also. In this case, you have to extend some other result of some other guys, not Rosinski, but it's the same thing. Now the question is, this is, a, this is the important question. How much does this invariant remember the random field? Now what do I mean by that? I mean, if two stationary asymmetric alpha stable random fields, not necessarily indexed by the same group, have isomorphic minimal group major space constructions, then do they have similar probabilistic properties? So this is a this is a very broad and vague question, but this is basically this is this is a parallel to what is called W star rigidity uh, for group actions. This is a term that was coined by Sorin Popa. He's quite a serious mathematician, as some of you know. And if, if you want to know more about W star rigidity, look at the survey paper of Adrian Iona. Uh, this came out in ICM uh, 2018. Uh, proceedings, or you look at, you just uh, uh, look at the video lecture of Adrian Ivana from YouTube. It's a, uh, it's a fantastic lecture. He's a very good lecturer. And uh, so what uh, this roughly means is that W strategy for actions is basically how much a group measure space construction remembers action, the properties of the action. Here, instead of actions, I'm asking the same kind of questions for random fields. So this is a W strategy question for symmetric alpha stable random fields. Now, of course, we, we will see how much we are going to be able to be successful in this, but we can ask another question, which is, okay, minimal representation is fine. How about instead of minimal representation, we can take any Rosinski representation, not necessarily minimal. Okay, we know that not all Rosinski representations are minimal in the sense that not all Rosinski representation can be written in terms of that. So that now becomes a bit difficult question. So how much a Rosinski group measure, measure space construction remember the stable random field? So this means you take a Rosinski representation and then go, go to that group measure space construction. We'll call it R Rosinski group measure space construction. Again, it's R because it's not unique. It's not necessarily the minimal group measure space construction, but it can still remember some probabilistic properties of XT. So that's the question. And here is the intuition behind asking this question. Why do we ask this question? Since any Rosinski representation can be written in terms of uh, any minimal representation, we do conjecture that many von Neumann algebraic aspects of the corresponding group measure space construction will become invariants, and many stochastic properties of the field will be remembered by any Rosinski minimal, Rosinski but not necessarily minimal group measure space construction. 
So one such example we have been able to give, and that is, this is why we have to specialize in the case when G is set B. In this case, we have actually shown that both ergodicity and complete lack of it are W strategy properties. I'll tell you what that means. So from now on, unless mentioned otherwise, G is going to be ZT. So unless we go to the last slide where we discuss, I think G is going to be ZT. Okay. Okay. So is the question rigidity question clear? What it means? So if you have two two random fields, not necessarily indexed by the same group, if they have the same group measure space construction corresponding to either a minimal and either the minimal representation or uh, you know a uh, 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 Arosinski representation, then do they have similar properties, those two random groups? This is the question. Now, one property that would be important is ergodicity. So I'll uh, mention a bit on that. So note that any stationary S alpha as random field, in fact, doesn't have to be S alpha as any stationary random field, induces a measure preserving shift action on R power ZD. By basically, it's a law of X. If you look at R power ZD, look at all omegas are such that XT omega as you at T runs over ZD, this path belongs to a subset of R power Z D. This is a measure. This is, this is a subset of, this is a subset of uh, this omega. This is a measurable subset of omega because each X T is measurable. And then you can apply P to that. It's a measurable subset of omega, so you apply P to it. That gives you what is called the law of this random, random field X T. Okay. So this stationarity just means that this shift action is this measure preserving. Ergodicity just means that this action, shift action, is actually ergodic. In other words, this shift action, the, all the shift in invariant subsets of R power ZD are PX trivial. This is ergodicity. So if you know ergodicity for just actions of Z, it's the same definition applied to ZD. That's all. Now, why is it important? I'll, I'll actually, I have a slide for that, but I'll, uh, I'm, I'm seeing that I'm not running completely on time, so I'll skip that slide. But roughly speaking, it helps in computation of asymptotics, thanks to ergodic theorem. So now, what do I mean by that? So it's basically ergodic theorem gives you limit of uh, certain averages, and therefore that is useful in probability, statistics, geometry, number theory, everywhere. Okay, so it's an important topic. I'll skip the next slide. So uh, basically, I have two applications. In the, in the case of stable random fields, one is for estimation of wind probability, another is uh, essentially estimation of parameters. But anyway, I think uh, I'll skip that slide, but the slide would be again with the organizers too, so you can always borrow the slides and see 28th page of the slide to see this. Okay, now for stable random fields, this is an important question. The question is, when is X to your body? And this question was already answered in the case of D equal to one, mainly when it's a random field index by Z by my supervisor in 2005, he gave a criteria based on the ergodic theoretic properties of the underlying group action. We extended this in 2013 uh, for D bigger than one. Again, it was a criteria just based on, purely based on the ergodic theoretic properties of the action. In this work, I have been able to give a new characterization for ergodicity or all D bigger than equal to one for Z D using group measure space construction. Now what is that? So that, now that's the next goal. That's uh, what I want to present now. So uh, this is the still result. Now this result will be in terms of any Rosinski representation and the corresponding group measure space construction. Suppose X is a stationary S alpha is a random field generated by a non-singular action, which is free. Now, what is free? Free means it's a group action, right? Free means all the stabilizers are trivial in the sense, other than the group element E, if you take any element which is non-identity element of in the group, it's going to move the points, okay? So that stabilizers are all trivial. So that's what this means. If that happens, then XT is algoric which is actually equivalent to weekly mixing. This is already known, but that's okay. If and only if the corresponding group measure space construction admits no two one factor in its central decomposition. Remember that definition, okay? This just means 
that if you go to this von Neumann algebra, so you, you start with a free action to generate this random field. Go to the group measure, sorry, go to the group measure space construction. Then if that guy, to that group measure space construction, go to its central decomposition, if that doesn't have any two one factor in its uh, central decomposition, in other words, almost all factors are not two one, then it's going to be ergodic and converse. If it's ergodic, not, almost all factors are not going to be of type two one. So it's a purely von Neumann algebraic criteria, as you can see. And only condition is this free condition on the action, which we have to impose. But I'll talk about that later also. Yeah, we can actually relax it in such a way that it's not, that not becomes a big deal. So we'll talk about it when we talk about the sketch of proof. Okay, let's first look, go through the corollaries. First corollary is that, note that here, I didn't take uh, necessarily, um, I just said generated, I didn't say, but it, I, I didn't say uh, I, that this is generated in a minimal representation. It was just any, any Rosinski representation, okay? So admitting no to one factor in its central decomposition, this becomes an invariant for any Rosinski group measure space construction of a fixed stationary stable random field, provided index by ZD, provided the underlying action is free. Whenever the underlying action is free, we'll abuse the terminology and we'll say it's a free Rosinski group measure space construction, okay? So admitting that no, admitting no to one factor in the central decomposition, it becomes an invariant. So uh, what I'm saying is this, so let, let me just write it down. So if you have free group measure space construction of such a random field that admits no to one factor in, in its central decomposition, these are purely you know, von Neumann algebraic property, then the same will be true for any free Rosinski group measure space construction of the same random. So you have the same random field, but you have two different actions coming from two Rosinski representations. They may not be minimal, but they'll be Rosinski, that's enough. They'll give rise to two different uh, von Neumann algebras, namely group, group measure space constructions. As long as both the actions are free, you can say that one, one doesn't admit any two one factor if and only the other one doesn't want. So this von Neumann algebraic property becomes an invariant for any Rosinski representation. Secondly, this is very interesting. This is basically if two stationary SL5 random fields indexed by ZD, what if possibly with two different Ds have isomorphic free Rosinski group measure constructions, then their ergodicity is equivalent. One of them is ergodic if and only the other one is ergodic. So what do I mean by that? So you have two stationary, now we have two random fields. One indexed by say Z1, so Z2 maybe another by Z3 say, okay? but Suppose they, they both are generated by free actions and the corresponding group measure space constructions are actually isomorphic as one number algebra. Then you can say that this is ergodic if and only that is ergodic. More interesting, so this is called W star rigidity of ergodicity. Okay? So ergodicity, the property of ergodicity is fully remembered by the group measure space construction. That's what this means. Okay? So if you go to a Rosinski group measure space construction, as long as the action is free, it's completely remembered, the property of ergodicity is completely remembered by, by this group major space construction. In particular, if you have two random fields, not necessarily indexed by the same group, which are generated by orbit equivalent actions, both are free. If it's orbit equivalent, one is free, will imply the other is also free. Then the same conclusion will hold, their ergodicity will be equivalent. So in other words, ergodicity is orbit equivalent rigid in the sense that it's preserved under orbit equivalent. This is not at all obvious unless you go through this result. Orbit equivalence is a very important equivalence. Uh, it's, uh, it's somewhere in between. It's not too strong an equivalence. It's neither, neither too strong nor too weak. It's very useful. The right kind of equivalence for group actions. And this, uh, this guy it preserves ergodicity, which is fantastic. So uh, the indexing groups having possibly different ranks, by ranks I mean their ranks as Z modules. In other words, what I'm saying is that they're the different Ds. Okay? So you have ZD1 and ZD2. It's actually very useful in this context, in this context of orbit equivalent, because there is a famous result of uh, Kohn's, Feldman, and Weiss from 1981 that states that any non-singular action of ZD is orbit equivalent to a non-singular action of Z. Okay, not necessarily ZD it can be action of an amenable group. In more generally, the action enough the, for the action to be amenable, but let's not get into those technicalities. But ZD is good enough. So any any non-singular action of ZD is orbit equivalent to some non-singular action of Z. What this means is that it is now possible 
to associate. So probabilistically, this is what this means. Associate a stationary S alpha S process to any stationary S alpha S random field index by any ZT in an ergodicity preserving manner. Because this uh, orbit equivalence will preserve ergodicity because of this corona. Now this actually may help in classification of such fields. So in order to understand what are all possible ergodic ZT index uh, random fields, it's enough to now look at all possible Z index ergodic random fields because you know you can always have a correspondence, uh, always have an association. So this is this is actually makes it so of, as we know processes are much easier to study than random field. So in some case sense, we are making a dimension reduction, huge dimension reduction. So D can be as, as big as D on 1 million. So it can be very high dimensional and yet this result will be true. Okay, so I think uh, I should wrap up soon. So I'll just quickly go through the sketch of proof and then wrap up. So what is the sketch of proof of the theorem? Okay, let me go back to the theorem once. So the theorem says that uh, XT is ergodic if and only if the group measure space construction admits no two one factor in its central decomposition, of course, corresponding to free action. So the proof goes as follows. First, we should see whether we, uh, we can prove it when uh, the action is also ergodic. Uh, you know, action is ergodic and XT is ergodic are two different con concepts. So if the action is ergodic, then we can do it thanks to a phenomenal algebra result, which connects phenomenal algebras with ergodic properties of the action. And I'm not going to, we're not going to go into the result because it's going to become technical then, and a result of ours from 2013. So this is a probabilistic input in the proof. This is a von Neumann algebraic slash uh, ergodic theoretic uh, input in the proof. Now, how can we now extend it? If something is known for ergodic, how do you extend it in the general case? The natural thing to do, if you're, an, you're a dynamical system person, you'll immediately say, let's go to the ergodic decomposition. Yes, but the question is, this is a non-singular action. Will it have uh, a good enough ergodic decomposition that will work? The answer is yes. And that's possible because we are working on a standard measure space. So before this work, I used to always think that standard measure spaces are useless subjects. They are only given for, uh, you know, it's, it's just a, a bunch of mathematicians uh, like uh, say descriptive set theorists, uh, you know, have a good time and that therefore they invented this uh, terminology. But no, it's actually pretty useful in ergodic theory and probability as well. And, uh, Thanks to this result of uh, Klaus Schmidt, this is, a, by the way, this, 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 uh, this uh, book has a Dilly connection, ISI Dilly connection, I think. This book, uh, this is a monograph written by Klaus Schmidt uh, based on lectures given in Delhi. Uh, so he, I think he visited ISI Delhi and gave a series of lectures. Uh, it's published by Macmillan India. At that time, at least Macmillan used to publish these monographs. Uh, so the version I have is a cyclo style version. It's very awful to read, but I could read the course. And then one can connect ergodic decomposition with the central decomposition, thanks to known results from von Neumann algebra. So using that, we can prove from, go from here to here. Okay. And uh, from the proof, so if, even if you don't follow the proof, just remember, do it for ergodic actions first and then use ergodic decomposition. That's, that's, the, that's the mode of proof. And from the proof, it transpires that free can be replaced by ergodically free everywhere. Everywhere in this slide, I've written free. The word free can be replaced by the phrase ergodically free. Now, what is ergodically free? Ergodically free means an action is called ergodically free. By the way, this is a definition that we coined in this paper. So uh, we call an action ergodically free if action restricted to any ergodic component is free. Now, obviously, if an action is free, it's going to be ergodically free. The converse is not true because there can be uncountably many ergodic components. Even if that uh, group is countable, the number of uh, uh, <coughs> ergodic components can be uncountable. We have an example also in our paper. So ergodically free is, uh, having ergodically free improves the theorems. So that's what we, we can do. And more importantly, all the known classes of uh, stable random fields are actually generated by ergodically free actions. So therefore, by putting this action, this extra assumption, everywhere in, in the paper, we are not putting much restriction. Secondly, we could also show using the same proof is that the, act, the random field is fully non ergodic if and only if all factors, almost all factors are of, are of type 2, 1. Of course, I have to tell you what it means by fully non ergodic which I'm not going to do. 
unless you ask me later. And uh, same characterization will hold for ergodic uh, or for ergodicity for max stable fields also. Index by ZD again. Okay. So these are the three things that transpire in the book. Okay. So a uh, little bit about future directions. So I think I'll quickly go through it. So there are many known results, no known uh, random fields, which should be uh, you know seen through the lens of our work, and we haven't done it. Some some examples are there, some known examples are there, but some some examples are not there. More importantly, we should see what is the corresponding von Neumann algebra in these cases. For example, this is known to be ergodic, and I think the action is also ergodic in this case. And then, of course, if the action is ergodic and free, then it will give you a factor. What type of factor? It's not a two-one factor. Is it a two-infinity factor or a type three factor? In particular, it's a type three factor. I think some of our von Neumann algebra colleagues will immediately uh, be very excited and so on. Also, is mixing a W strategy proper? So in this, this, this is the key work. We have to connect with this work. And also, what is the role of type three factors? I have not defined what they are, but whatever they are. In particular, if you look at boundary actions of uh, free groups, which was considered in this work, then uh, what would be the corresponding random field? Will it be ergodic? So these kind of questions uh, should be looked at. And finally, and this last but not the least, I think, is can we extend our second half of the results to other groups? And as we saw, and this is a remark in the paper also, the hindrance is not at all algebraic. It's not at all operator algebraic. The hindrance is ergodic theoretic. And the main hindrance is the unavailability of ergodic theorem for non-singular actions of groups. So these are you know, infinite, part of infinite ergodic theory. So in particular, Lindenstrauss, the, the, uh, the younger Lindenstrauss, the uh, ergodic theorist, he had proved uh, in 2001 a result uh, of uh, for probability measure preserving actions, ergodic theorem for that. Can we extend that to non-singular actions? That's the question. And uh, we don't know the answer. I don't know what to do there. But for discrete he Heisenberg group, however, uh, Jared uh, has some results. So we hope to use those. Perhaps it might work. And by the way, stable random fields indexed by discrete Heisenberg groups might be of interest because Heisenberg groups, uh, you know, they crop up uh, naturally in space-time fields in space-time models, so this in physics. So this might be of uh, uh, interest. So this might be the next project, but I don't know. And since I don't know, I think it's a good time to stop. Thank you very much. And uh, some supplementary uh, slides are there. Uh, some technicalities, especially the group measure space construction definition and its connection to ergodic theory is given uh, in these four slides. And then there are some references. Thank you very much for the patience. Thank you, Patuni. Any yes. questions? Uh, yes. Can I ask? Yes. Uh, I suppose that uh, as ergodicity is a basic irreducible component in operator algebras, it is also a bit for random fields too. And so that's the basic thing to study, I suppose. I don't know that. Yes. Yes, yes. But you are saying that if a random field turns out to be ergodic, when you do the cross product, you are never going to see a two one factor. Yes. Right? Yes. So, in a way, it's good because then it, it doesn't attract the interest of majority of Sorin Popo. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because he's away from. <laughs> that, that, no, that's but, the same, yeah. that, that, that is true, but on the other hand, uh, Voss has worked on W star rigidity for uh, type 3 actions, not, not necessarily PMP. I, 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 I yes, Voss. So that's, where, that's, where I, yeah, so that's where I'm coming to. So okay. I'm trying to ask you that if you say that the cross product or the von Neumann algebra itself is, it is an invariant probably for your dynamics. Right. But maybe it's in a way too much to say that, too much to call it an invariant because it's too huge an object to be that an invariant true. for such a small thing. That is true. That is so, true. So, no, but I mean, because it's very huge. I think it has a lot of information, though. I mean, yeah. I, I, I know what you mean. Yes. Yes. It, yes. yes. yes it will have, 
it, it will it will definitely have a lot of back and forth between the construction and exactly. your exactly uh, uh, random field exactly but so one thing is clear that the dynamics that you write uh, on the random field is mm -hmm. directly related to the modular theory of the von Neumann algebra that you cook up. I mean, that is why you essentially do not see two one factor somehow. I don't so, know what is modular theory. So yeah, that uh, we have to talk more later. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. So, so yeah, there are two dynamics, let's say, and one is like an enemy of the other somehow. That's how they are going as okay. your results are kind okay. of saying. Okay. So, uh, but I am asking you the following, like, Let's take the simplest example, both both two random fields indexed by Z. Mm -hmm. Let's say both are ergodic. Mm -hmm. So when you do the cross products, you will not get a two-one factor. Right. I mean, the uh, Rosinski uh, picture, a yeah. minimal picture. Right, right, yeah. But then can you say that the two cross products should also be the same. If they are not the same, you are saying that there are actually too many such random fields indexed yes. by Z. Yes, yes. They may not be the same. Yeah. I think so. I think so. Because, yeah, for example, there is a class called mixed moving average. And I actually computed this uh, invariant uh, for mixed moving averages. And, you know, it depends on a particular set. And essentially, Essentially, we'll see that for every set y, we can construct a mixed moving average. And that will give you y, y being the y that uh, on which you take the direct integral. So you, you, you'll have too many of them. You're right. Yeah. Even in the, this restricted class, there are too many of them. Yeah. It's, it's hard to classify them. That's a, that's a bigger problem. You're right. I mean, I think our best hope is to classify using properties, like one property is it going to be the blue star digit or not? More general classification just using the von Neumann algebra might be very, very difficult, as you rightly pointed out. Yeah. There are too many of them, as you said. Even in with Z. And let's not even go to other groups. Even with Z. Yeah. That's a very good observation. So, uh, Patanilda, may I ask a question? Sure, sure, sure. I have a, first one was Kunal, right? Who is this? This is. A... Yes, yes. I, have, I asked Kunal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could hear the voice. Yeah. Uh, who is the second person? I can't. Yeah. So, it's Ishan. Oh, yeah. Please. Yeah. So, uh, I, so I believe that the most of the questions in the end that you pointed out were all uh, things on the uh, probabilistic side, and you want to infer some information on the von Neumann algebra side. Yes, yes. But I believe one can do it from the other side also. So, for instance, one, one the, of them was actually so just to, just before you ask the question. Look at the third question. If you start with the type three factor, how will it transfer to the random field? So right. that question right. starting from is, is yeah. that the kind of question you are asking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for instance, if we start with the we take the decomposition and right, like like for instance, you have already said that if all the you know the uh, fibers are all uh, type three, then what can we say? So similarly, if all are let's say have property T or some rigid property, right. that would be very interesting. Yeah. So very uh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. How does even the, just for Z? Even just for Z. Yeah, even, even for, for just for Z. Z. Yeah, yeah, just, for Z. just for Z. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't know, for amenable groups, uh, is it very easy to construct type 3 factors? I mean, if you have, maybe for free groups, it's much easier. But uh, You have to just start with an action which doesn't preserve the me measure in the right way. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, okay. I mean, 2 infinity is easier, but 2, 3 is always harder with Z or ZDs. That's why sort of belief, but I don't know, you, you might be knowing, knowing. Uh, because, because amenable groups is most likely to preserve a measure. So, I mean, it's hard to construct an example. Exactly. Exactly. That is the problem. But free groups uh, have a lot of examples. For example, if you look at the boundary action of free group, that's going to be type three. And then you can ask if this is a boundary action of free group is free and ergodic. So the corresponding, it's a factor. It's a type three factor. Now the question is, if you look at the corresponding uh, stable random field, how does it uh, how it manifest in the properties? So that's uh, the, that's a question that one can ask. And my belief is that once you go beyond free groups, beyond amenable groups, 
there's already a lot of rigidity theory for the PMP actions. So it might actually help us. Uh, you know, as, as, uh, as Ishan was asking, Ishan was asking that, you know, if you, if you have a, a property T group, it already has some rigidity. And it, you know, property, T, Bernoulli auctions of property T groups are, uh, PMP actions are anyway known to, known to be W strategy. Will we have a similar theory in the stable random fields case? So these kind of questions, uh, you know, can be asked. These are all in, interesting questions. I have no answer to them. So I would love to talk to you guys more. Uh Partho, this is Antar here. Um, yes, I'd like to ask you a um, few more very basic probability related questions. Sure, sure, sure. sure. I'm, I'm going to ask the, um, so there are two questions here and you can answer both because they might have an interplay. Okay. So the first thing which comes in my mind, why are you taking, why aren't you, can, why can't you take alpha equals to two? What goes wrong yeah, when very, the, very, when very, the yeah. process is Gaussian? There must be something going wrong, right? Yeah. And there is something yes, you yes, said, which is very statistically counterintuitive. That is the, when you said that you have an alpha stable symmetric process, say uh, indexed by uh, a very large dimensional mm -hmm. um, um, ZD. Right. You can, uh, and it is ergodic and you can keep this ergodic property preserved and be done it uh, as a process, alpha stable process on one dimension. This is very counterintuitive statistically very because there is something definitely going terribly wrong because local statistics are never going to work. There has to be something changing. No, actually, you know, Perhaps they are related. Or, so you can no, comment or, on this. The orbit equivalence is completely going to destroy the local statistics. And that's completely true. The orbit, this orbit equivalence is a completely pure ergodic theoretic beast. It has nothing probabilistic about it. That is the, that is the answer. Right. So, okay, so so that I understand. But then, what are the like? So, what are the kind of statistics which you are being able to keep? Um, this question. is something would be um, important to um, look into because what your Very work, good. if you would like to use in any um, probabilistic statistical questions to be answered. Um, the statistics which you are preserving, if they are very esoteric, mm -hmm. which seems to be the case it's um, possible, uh, to me, because uh, local statistics are not going to help. But but um, um, but probably the another thing which is helping you here is you are not working with the Gaussian distribution. Yes, I'll tell you why that is helping. But before that, let me answer. Perhaps my guess is under some conditions, behavior of extremes can be perhaps related. I'm not sure because this is already behavior of extremes is already related to the ergodic theory part. Right. right. So therefore, my guess is that it might be related also to the one and energy. Mm -hmm. But that is my best bet. I'm not sure whether other statistics will, they might break down, as you said, very rightly said, because that is why it's happening. Because ergodic, this is completely ergodic theoretic thing. This, you know, this, uh, this equivalence doesn't preserve any probabilistic paths at all. There. So that is the problem. Yes, it's a very good observation. Now, what goes wrong in Gaussian? It's a good question. I should have pointed that out also. So here, see, I used that. So the, uh, let me go back here. I think I'll go back to the slide and then I'll point out right there. So how did I prove uh, my <coughs> theorem? I used that two minimal representations were isomorphic as group actions. Right? That was a major step, step. This will break down the moment you go to L2 spaces. So here, remember, these group actions are actions. And then the actions are coming in on a space S, and then we are taking them to L alpha. How are we going to take them to L alpha? By doing this. So I didn't specify that too much, but if you look at the Rosinski representation, I'll go back to that second point. So here, this is a completely L alpha thing, because F is in L alpha, so all of these are in L alpha. Now, L alpha, whenever alpha is strictly less than two, is at most a Banach space. It's never at the Hilbert space. It's at most a Banach space, so it's very rigid. In fact, for alpha between zero and one, it's not even a Banach space. It's a very rigid linear space. So it has very few isometries. Because it has very few isometries, one can show that two Rosinski representations coming from two different, uh, two actions coming from two different uh, minimal representations are actually isomorphic. It comes from analysis. This isomorphism actually comes from analysis. It comes from an isometry of corresponding L alpha spaces. It's hard in theory, hard in direct. 
In L2, this won't be the case. In other words, in L2, you will have various minimal representations, which won't be isomorphic as group actions. And this entire theory will fail. So, of course, in Gaussian, there are better theories. You don't need to go through Rosinski theory to, to get your results. And therefore, people don't do that. It's a question you fail because ergodic theory property of the of the action will be preserved if you go from one minimal representation to the other. You can talk about representations, Rasinski representations, and also 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 minimal representations. But there will be too many of them because of uh, you know L two L two is a very less rigid space, you know, it's a very flexible space, and therefore the analysis will fail. So that is where the problem will arise. So this theorem will not be able to prove. Mm -hmm. So the rigidity is actually helping us here. Rigidity of, rigidity of L alpha spaces actually helping us. So the, both are good questions. Thank you. I mean, second one, I have no idea. Thank it's you. a very good question. Perhaps, perhaps extremes, but I don't know. And that would be an interesting one to study, I would say. Yeah. Yes. Thanks extremes for a very, also, very, also, very nice talk. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. So many questions means it's good. Always uh, feels good for a speaker. <laughs> It was a very technical talk. I was very tense, I must say that, because this is an audience uh, who are really serious in both subjects, in all subjects, actually. There are, I think I saw Ritisha also coming in, so there are good uh, theories also. Parthunil, I'm Rahul. Yeah, Achha. please. Um, you know, the orbit, basically coming from a probabilist, orbits are related to the Poincare recurrence and all yes. those things, right? Yes. So yes. what is the connection? I mean, is there any connection uh, in the algebra part of it, when you call it orbit equivalent? You know, hmm. uh, I mean, are, are we measuring some kind of a, the size of the space, uh, which we do in, in, in measure theory? That's a good question. Yeah. So I don't know enough of one of algebra to answer it. Uh, but my guess is that, um, my guess is that orbit equivalence may preserve some of the properties, like Poincare recurrence, since you mentioned. For example, conservativity of an action, which is essentially recurrence, right? I think orbit equivalence will preserve that. So if an action, conservative basically means that it doesn't have any wandering set. So basically it will come back very often as we move in the orbits. So that will be preserved. And how will that translate to the von Neumann algebra uh, is yet to be explored. If I can actually explore it completely, then I will be able to answer the question that Antoda was asking. You know, second question, because conservativity is closely related to the uh, the notion of uh, conservativity and dissipativity, which gives rise to the Hoff decomposition, is closely related to the uh, asymptotics of the maximum. So that's uh, you know the qu two questions that you and Antoda asked are actually related, but I don't know the answer. So I am hoping that you know on some day in future I'll be able. To. Yeah, thanks, thank thanks, Parthenil. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So, uh, Parthenil, the one quick comment. Yeah. So, that one point you were mentioning this uh, W star and the fact that it's now called von Neumann. So, just wanted to clarify this thing. Yeah. So, yeah. actually, uh, this was open for some time in the early days of von Neumann algebras to find a, uh, how do you call it, like a non spatial, because when you defined it, you used a Hilbert space. Right, I didn't mention that. I just, yeah, yeah right, you're right. Yeah, so, right. Uh, non spatial definition. So, that is just that, you know, it has a pre dual. Okay, so okay. Uh, that was called a W star algebra. So, weak star algebra. Achai, achai, that's achai. why C star is closed star. And so, weak star is coming from pre dual. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, W star, then it became uh, by a theorem that these two are the same. So, one I meant W star. Okay. So, what Isan is saying, essentially, I, I completely hit this thing under the carpet. It's possible. I defined the Bernoulli algebra using a, what is called a concrete definition. So I started with a separable Hilbert space, and I took a sub subspace of that, a subalgebra of that. But one one can define Bernoulli algebra uh, more abstractly, okay? And then under under suitable conditions, I think they are going to be equivalent. That's what uh, Ethan is saying. So yeah, is that what you are saying, right? I mean, the abstract definition and the concrete definition are actually equivalent. Yes, exactly. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for this remark. So I, I actually didn't know. So all this W star rigidity, this term came from W star algebra, I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's a rich theory of W star rigidity by these guys, this Popa and all the other guys who are there. Like, so Popa, Vas, Adrian Iona, and all their postdocs and PhD students. So 
I don't know if there is, we can find more connection. Very interesting. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the comment. So let's thank uh, Patunil again. And uh, thank you, Patunil. Well, thank you for the invitation. Yeah, yeah it, it was very nice to uh, hear the talk as well as the audio. Uh,